350 years ago, England suffered from its last serious outbreak of the plague. This is the incredible story of one tiny village's courageous efforts to stop the plague spreading through the whole country, and the example of how these ordinary people responded to extraordinary circumstances, I think can act as an inspiration to us all these years later. This is the story of Eam, England's plague village. Eam nestles in the Hope Valley in the beautiful Peak District in Derbyshire, in the centre of England. You know, when I last visited Eam, oh, it was beautiful, it was a warm summer's day, and the village, quite frankly, looks idyllic. Chocolate box, unless you knew the story behind it, of course. 30 miles south is the county town of Derby, with Chesterfield uh, to the east, Buxton to the west, uh, Sheffield to the northeast, and Manchester about 45 miles away to the northwest. Principally an agricultural community, the village pub gives you a clue to its previous heritage, the miners' arms. Lead has been mined from around the village since Roman times, and I have a little story to tell you about that later. Back in 1665, lead mining and agriculture were the two staple industries of the village, which had a population of no more than 800. Let me set the scene by introducing you to the England of 1665 and the full horror of the plague that broke out, because without that, it's hard to imagine the magnitude of the decisions that were taken by ordinary people in the tiny village of Eam. England at that time was going through a turbulent period in its history. The English Civil War had ended less than 20 years before, and that conflict had ripped the country apart. It had pitted communities and even families against each other as Parliament and King struggled for supremacy. Nearly 200,000 people died in England alone during that conflict. In fact, the proportion killed uh, during the English Civil War is on par with Britain's losses in the First World War. And the fallout will impact our story in Little Eam. It ended with King Charles I being publicly executed, the only king ever to do so, and Oliver Cromwell establishing, for all intents and purposes, a dour religious military dictatorship, something like a sort of like an English Taliban. Yet festivals and holidays were banned, dancing was forbidden, maypoles were cut down, Catholics were persecuted, Christmas was famously cancelled. In fact, uh, Cromwell's soldiers wandered around London sniffing out festive cooking and ensuring that people prayed solemnly and observed Puritan worship instead of celebrating at Christmas. Uh, his troops often marched in a type of goose step and, and hence that children's nursery rhyme, Goosey Goosey Gander. Whither shall I wander? Upstairs, downstairs, in my lady's chamber. There I met an old man who wouldn't say his prayers, so I took him by the left leg and threw him down the stairs. The village of Eam was strongly Puritan in its religious beliefs and it sided with Puritan Cromwell and Parliament. At the outset of the Civil War, the vicar of the village church, a man called Sherland Adams, was a supporter of the king, which is a bit of a problem. In fact, he supplied local lead to the royalist armies. I said I'd come back to that, that lead story, didn't I? So anyway, the village priest was supplying lead to the royalist army to make musket balls to shoot at Puritans like the people of Eam. There's something here about knowing your audience, isn't there? And not surprisingly, he was run out of town. His replacement, Thomas Stanley, was from the other end of the, the religious spectrum, an avowed, devout Puritan, and a huge hit with the villagers, therefore. Happy days. Unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And when Cromwell died, Parliament invited the executed king's son to return as Charles II. Known as the Merry Monarch, Charles was famous for partying, horse racing, gambling, and a string of extramarital affairs and children. Consequently, King Charles II had no time for the Puritans and their killjoy outlook on life. Christmas was definitely back on the agenda. As head of the Church of England, he introduced a less puritanical form of worship in church, the Book of Common Prayer. Puritans saw it at best as a weakened down form of the true religion and at worst the beginnings of a return to Catholicism in England. Up in Eam, Thomas Stanley was having none of it. He refused to acknowledge this new law, the Act of Uniformity and the new form of service he had to conduct. And therefore, Thomas Stanley was sacked and he was replaced with a young vicar in his 20s uh, who was a supporter of the new regime, 
William Mompesson. And what a lovely appointment for a vicar and his young family, this beautiful village. Mompesson arrived in Eam in 1664 to find that Stanley had left the church, but he hadn't actually left the village. He was living on the outskirts of the village and he was holding rival services on a Sunday. So there we had this tiny village community very visibly split between two Sunday services. And a year later, the plague struck. Before I continue the story of Eam, I want to explain what the plague was and the effect of the plague in London. Because I want you to understand just how scary this plague was when it finally came to our little village up in Derbyshire. Symptoms of the plague included a high fever, vomiting, spasms, and finally the victim developed dark swelling under their skin on the, the lymph nodes under their armpit and in the groin. And it was this swelling that was called a bubo, giving the plague its better known term, bubonic plague. And it often took less than 24 hours from infection to death. The death rate from the plague, bubonic plague, was staggering. The bubonic plague had first appeared in England nearly 300 years beforehand. In that outbreak, known as the Black Death, a third of Europe's population had been wiped out. In the intervening years, it appeared several times in England, especially uh, in the Elizabethan period. And whilst reasonably localised, very often in London, the biggest city, uh, just the very word plague was enough to send the population into planet panic. During the Civil War, Less than 20 years before our story, an outbreak of the plague in the besieged city of Chester resulted in over 2,000 deaths, again a third of the city's population. And now, it was back. The earliest case of the plague uh, of 1665-66 was in the spring of 1665, when it broke out in London. Not actually in the city, but just outside the walls in the squalid, cramped township of St Giles in the Fields. It's now very much part of London. As with most plagues and pandemics, you know, the lower your social economic class and the more crowded your accommodation, the more prone you were to infection. On the 30th of April, 1665, Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, great fears of the sickness here in the city. It's being said that two or three houses are already shut up. God help us all. And panic spread through the population even faster than the plague. The king fled the capital and so did the courts. Parliament was prorogued or suspended. Remember Boris Johnson prorogued Parliament a few years ago and eventually it moved to Oxford 50 miles away where the king had also taken up residence. It reached its peak in London in September when 20,000 people died in the city. The outbreak of 1665 definite, definitely killed 68,000 people in London. But as the bills of mortality, which were a, a record kept by the parish churches, didn't include Catholics or nonconformists or Jews, that figure would be higher. In fact, the Museum of London think the figure was closer to 100,000. 100,000 people dying in a city of 500,000 people. Nearly one in five people in London dead. Not one in five people who caught it, one in five of the total population killed by this plague. If you put that into today's figures, that would mean instead of the roughly 200,000 people who've died of COVID in the UK, that figure would be closer to 12 million. I want you to Pause and imagine the fear and panic if that was the case today with those sort of figures. And what it must have been like in the 1660s. Imagine how suspicious you would have been of strangers arriving in your community. What would you think when you heard that the house next door had the plague? Whilst people knew the signs uh, and whilst they knew and feared the results, they were in complete ignorance as to its causes. We now know that bubonic plague was carried by black rats arriving on merchant ships and it was spread by fleas, biting the inf infected rats and then biting humans. However, back in the 17th century, the assumption was that it was spread by bad air. And the solution was simple. Breathe in, clean air. So first up, flee to the countryside if you could. Secondly, people carry little posies containing uh, spices or herbs or flowers under their nose to breathe in the, the, nice, the nice smells. Uh, and here's the origins of the children's nursery rhyme, ring a ring a rosies. Another way to purify the air, or to purify bad air, was smoking tobacco, believe it or not. 
In fact, it was seen as such a powerful preventative remedy that children were encouraged to smoke tobacco to ward off the plague. Unbelievable. But seeing as in the 17th century, two thirds of children didn't live to see their 16th birthday, I guess, you know, the fear of lung cancer was the least of their lifestyle problems. If you're enjoying this story, then please click the like button below and also subscribe to hear more stories in the future. The authorities who were still left in London desperately tried to prevent the spread of the plague. And the key to their approach was social distancing. Yep, we've been here before, folks. Public assemblies, including theatres and football matches, were banned. Uh, markets and fairs were, um, were, were closed, resulting in considerable economic hardship. Beggars were barred from entering the city at its gates. Any household with a plague sufferer was quarantined for 40 days. A red cross was painted on their door and parish officials brought them food. And guards were actually placed outside to prevent anyone entering or leaving. And indeed, anyone leaving a quarantined house committed a felony punishable by death. So that's great, isn't it? Stay in the house and get the plague from your family or go outside and, 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 be, and be put to death for coming out of a house that's got plague in it. A curfew was installed from 9 p.m. each night, which allowed the, the sick to actually come out uh, for clean air. Men called searchers removed bodies from the infected houses at night and took them to mass burial pits outside the city walls. And relatives were not allowed to attend the funeral. Isn't that absolutely amazing that we've seen so many of those things all over again with COVID? The problem with all this social distancing was that whilst contact with infected tissue, and there's nothing more infected than a dead human with the plague, and inhaling infected respiratory droplets did spread the disease, the real spreaders were the infected fleas feasting, feasting on the infected rats. And in fact, in fact, it was only when the rats weren't available that the fleas looked for a new home, humans. And only extreme cold or lack of a food supply killed them. And so, thanks to their new victims, the fleas hitched a ride with traders and refugees escaping London. I wanted to tell you that backstory because I want you to appreciate the enormity of the plague. The panic, the fear, government ceasing to, to function normally, people fleeing at the very sound of it. Authorities and the population weren't really sure what measures worked and which didn't. You know, the, the remedies, whether it was smoking tobacco or social distancing or posies or banning fairs, um, were based upon the flawed assumption of how the plague was spread. The only thing that was definite was that it was a mass killer, one in five Londoners killed. And so we come back to Ian. One evening in September 1665, the worst month in London, a parcel of cloth ordered by the village tailor Alexander Hadfield arrived from London. Upon opening the box, his assistant, a man called jo young man called George Vickers, found that the cloth was damp, and so he gave it a really good shake and hung it out to dry in front of the fire. Unfortunately, the cloth was not just damp, it contained fleas, and George had inadvertently released them into Ian. Within 24 hours, George Vickers was dead. The plague had claimed its first victim in Ian, and he wasn't to be the last. From September to December that year, a further 42 villagers died, including two of the tailor's stepchildren. A particularly harsh winter killed some of the fleas and led to the rest hibernating. But come the spring of 1666, as the infected fleas came out of hibernation and started reproducing, it took off again with a vengeance in the village. Panic began to spread and in all likelihood, it was gonna turn into a stampede. And it was at this moment that the young parish priest, William Momperson, urged the villagers to adopt a bold and selfless course of action. To stay put and not spread the, the plague to the neighbouring villages and towns. Let's just pause here. The vicar, who incidentally had already sent his children away, was now suggesting that the everyone stay in the village where there was a plague that could kill anywhere between a third and two thirds of them. Oh, and by the way, they didn't actually, most, a lot of them didn't like this vicar, still supported his deposed predecessor, who still lived on the edge of the village. His bold plan was met with distinct lack of enthusiasm. And then a supporter appeared. None other than the previous vicar, Thomas Stanley himself, who'd lost his livelihood to William Momperson. 
The villagers respected Puritan minister urged them to join Mompesson and himself and go into self-imposed quarantine. Self-imposed quarantine with a good chance they would die an agonising death to save their neighbours. It says a lot about Thomas Stanley, I think, a man with no political or church authority, but obviously with huge moral authority, that the villagers agreed. And so in June 1666, the village of Eam in Derbyshire went into isolation. Boundary stones were established around the perimeter of the village, uh, beyond which no inhabitants would go, and past which no outsider would enter. Food was brought by the neighbouring villagers and left on those boundary stones. Even the Earl of Devonshire from nearby Chatsworth House brought supplies. Holes were drilled into the stones and the villagers of Eam left money there for the purchases. And the holes were actually filled with vinegar in an effort to sterilise the coins before outsiders picked them up. It was at one of the boundary stones that Emmett Siddle, a 22-year-old who lived across the street from the tailor's house, used to secretly meet her fiancé, Roland Tor, uh, from the neighbouring village of Stony Middleton. They would stand apart, love at social distance. Mompesson closed the church and he and Stanley conducted open-air services in a disused quarry where social distancing could be practised. Stanley wrote wills for the dying villagers. Mompesson's young wife, Catherine tended the sick. Ahead of their times, the villagers of Ian realised that handling infected dead bo bodies probably spread the plague. So rather than gathering the dead for burial in the churchyard, they buried, um, they buried people when they died close to their homes. And across the village, you can still find these small plots of land with headstones of the families who had lived nearby. As the summer progressed, so did the activity of the fleas. The plague swept through Eam. In August alone, 79 people died, and Mompesson, in a letter, described the smell of sadness and death in the air. On the 3rd of August, the hapless tailor, Alexander Hadfield, who had ordered that cloth from London a year previously, perished. And on the 22nd of August, Mompesson's young wife, Catherine, who had been tending the sick throughout the quarantine, finally succumbed herself and passed away at the age of 27. In the space of eight days, Elizabeth Hancock of Riley Farm, uh, just outside the village, lost her husband and six children. The villagers from the nearby uh, Stony Middleton watched from the safety of a nearby hill as she buried her family in the field next to her farm. And you can still see that sad collection of Riley graves to this day. In a property now quaintly called Rose Cottage, all nine members of the Thorpe family perished. Finally, the cold weather arrived, and on the 1st of November, 1666, farm worker Abraham Morton was the last villager to die from the plague. He was one of 18 Mortons from the village to be taken by the plague. With no more cases, the villagers finally came out of their four-month period of isolation. When the quarantine was lifted, Roland Tord, remember him, the, the lover from uh, Emmett Siddle's lover, uh, who used to meet at the Boundary Stone? Uh, he was one of the first people to re-enter the village, only to find that Emmett, her parents and five of her siblings had died. Only three-year-old Joseph, her brother, survived. But crucially, the plague had not spread to the nearby villages or towns of Sheffield or Chesterfield or Manchester. The aim of the isolation had worked but at a terrible price. A total of 260 villagers, somewhere between a third and a half of the population, had died. A lady called Jane Hawksworth lost 25 relatives and in-laws. Mompesson and Stanley, of course, were among the survivors. But possibly the most amazing story was that of Marshall Howell, um, the, the village gravedigger, the sextant. Despite being handling dead bodies <laughs> on a regular basis and actually catching the plague himself, he survived. Soon afterwards, Mompesson left the village for a new post at Ekring in Nottinghamshire. But interestingly, the new parishioners had heard of him and were very wary that their new priest could be bringing the plague with him, so they forced him to live outside their village. Mompesson remarried and he ended his days at Southall Minster at the age of 70. Thomas Stanley stayed in Eam. In many respects, he was the unsung hero in this incredible story.
with no position of formal authority. It was his charisma and personal standing that convinced many of the people of Eam to rally behind Mompesson and stay for that quarantine. Thomas Stanley died in 1670, four years after the plague had left the village. Bubonic plague has never returned to Britain since that period. However, according to the World Health Organization, it still exists in the world. And indeed, in the last 10 years, there have been cases reported in Peru, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Madagascar. Amongst the methods that the WHO recommends for managing bubonic plague are isolating those with the disease, disinfecting and using safe burial places, all of which were practiced by the good people of Eam over 350 years ago. They say that history repeats itself. Maybe if we take a more notice of history, we might have learnt the lessons and our handling of COVID might have been more swifter and more effective. The story of Ian fills me with both a sense of sadness and a sense of optimism. Their decision to go into self-imposed quarantine when they knew that the plague was so deadly is an incredible act of bravery and self-sacrifice. What would you have done? I mean, what would you do if someone told you that a disease had arrived that would kill a third of you and it arrived in your community or street? Would you run? Or would you sacrifice yourself and your family to save others? Even when the death toll was mounting during their quarantine, the people of Eam didn't flinch, and only two people left the village during that period. To stay there when people around you are dying must have taken incredible courage, and maybe a faith that we don't tend to have in the Western world nowadays. Even if their understanding of the causes of the plague and how it spread, you know, bad air versus actually infected fleas were wrong, they undoubtedly saved the communities around them from the horrors of the plague. But for me, the villagers of EM did something far more important. They didn't wait for the king or the government or the local landed gentry at Chatsworth House to do something. They made their own decision. They showed you don't need to be rich or famous or powerful to choose to make a difference in the world. And this moral leadership and bravery by ordinary people, I think is an example to us in our current times. If you enjoyed this video and like what I'm about, then become a supporter for less than the cost of a pint a month. Details are appearing in a link right at the top of the screen right now, and they're also in the description below. Keep safe, and I'll see you with some more great stories very soon.